guess I'm late to the party on this one, really, because there's been many people online talking about this for a, a fair while, I guess. But uh, I really want to talk about porn addiction and its impact. Uh, you know, lots of people out there will talk about porn addiction and its impact upon the, the lives of young men, of course, and that's becoming more of a, of a known thing. But I, obviously, because of my background, I want to talk about it from the background of a Qigong or martial arts teacher, especially, although I will touch upon, you know, the rest of life as well. It's, it's something that, um, I guess, has kind of creeped up on everybody. Um, and I think as a teacher, like when I started teaching, I was quite young, too young, as I've said before. Um, so a lot of the people I were teaching were older than me. Now, as I get older, lots of the people are younger than me. That's just the way it goes. So I have a lot of young men and women. In fact, my school is about 50-50 men and women on the whole. Sometimes in the martial art groups, the percentage to men is a little higher, but not that much, to be honest. Um, and I think that's a good thing. But in the Qigong school, it's about 50-50. And this, uh, you know, sort of phenomena of young men coming into the martial arts and wanting to, or, or the internal arts, whatever, and wanting to use them as a way to grow and develop is not a new idea. Of course, this is something that has been standard for these arts for, <laughs> for a long time. Uh, you know, almost like a, in the old days, felt, it almost seems to me like it was an alternative to military service or something even. But times have changed and people need different things. And, uh, and this whole... Uh, this whole sort of paradigm shift around sort of the way we live our lives and, and the way we communicate online and things like this is, has a major shift on the nature of young men. So in this video, I want to talk about young males. I think that, and the problems that young males have, young, young women have their own um, issues, of course, but there's a couple of things there. One, they're slightly different. I don't think that porn addiction is such an issue for females. They have other problems. Um, and secondly, uh, as, a, as a male, I feel more qualified to talk about men. So it's men I'm going to focus on particularly, and young men, especially men in younger generations than myself. I think that uh, I've spoken about this before, that I have some things that I think should be standard for males, manners, etiquette, sense of chivalry, those kind of things. But then, of course, there's also the health, well-being, robustness of males, um, that I think that these porn addictions are um, impacting. Now, I started these arts young, and I also studied Chinese medicine when I was fairly young as well, started in my, my teenage years. And even with the Chinese medicine aside, I still always had a knowledge of the kidney system. And I think that most uh, practitioners of Qigong or Chinese martial arts will have at least a cursory understanding of the, of the kidney system, even if they don't understand it in, in detail. Now, obviously, the kidneys in Chinese medicine house your essence, which are the blueprints for everything else in your system. They are the fuel. They call it, they talk about it being like the oil in the oil lamp. Um, but to me, it's like the, the pillar or the platform that supports everything else. Your physical health and robustness is dependent upon the strength of the kidneys. All of the other organs are dependent upon the strength of the kidneys and by association, the essence, the jing. Not only that, but your mental health is dependent upon the robustness of the kidneys as well. This might be something people aren't so familiar with in Chinese if they're not so sh comfortable with some of these Chinese medical theories. But the root of your psychological well-being, your self-esteem, your levels of being able to overcome anxiety, your levels of personal strength and will, these are linked very much to the kidneys as well. If the kidney's essence becomes weak and that collapses, both your physical and your mental health suffers. So they're fairly important. <laughs> they're fairly major. The root of yin and yang sit here, or functionally, the functional aspects of yin and yang in your body sit here within the kidney system. Now the essence obviously is, is linked to your sexuality. Not, it's an oversimplification to call Jing your sexual fluids. That's like a, a whole other subject <laughs> that, that needs exploring, that, that they're not quite the same. But it is true that your sexual fluids and your sexuality and ejaculation and sexual arousal and all of these things, they take from your essence so that there is a healthy level of uh, sexual activity, and then of course there is excess and 
not just excessive amount, but unhealthy natures of your sexual activity can deplete the essence and damage it as well. Meaning that if you don't have a healthy relationship to sexuality, both your physical and your psychological health is going to suffer. Now, I would suggest that the society's way or society's view that it gives on sexuality and sex is not healthy and is not balanced. So therefore, already there's a kind of clash between conventional societal views and thinking and Chinese medical theory anyway, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But more to the point, what I would associate the kidneys with when I started these arts was older people. So therefore, older people are more likely to have kidney depletion because when you're a kid, you have plenty of kidney energy. And as you age over the course of your life, that kidney energy disappears. So when I was learning and I was studying, the assumption was that older people are more likely to have kidney chi or, or kidney deficiency, a weakness in that area, a weakness in their essence. Whereas younger people are not likely to have kidney deficiency, are not likely to have a deficiency in the essence, they're just not. Yin deficiency for young people, kidney yin deficiency, if you know what that is, would be quite rare, add with kidney yang deficiency. I would associate those kinds of conditions only with people who'd had chronic sicknesses or perhaps really strong psychological scarring trauma when they were very, very young. So certainly in martial arts classes, you never encountered any of the weaknesses that go with kidneys in younger people. It was normally older students. That's why younger students shouldn't have knee pain or back pain or tinnitus or fatigue or tiredness or, or emotional fragility. Or Those are things I would not associate younger people as having when I was learning. So then, and that wasn't, definitely it was true, that was the case. Younger people did not have these issues. Younger males did not suffer with kidney weakness, not really. Then as you get um, you know, as times have changed, now what's happening is I'm getting young people with kidney deficiency, and lots of them, and young males, young males with kidney yin deficiency, young males with kidney yang deficiency. Basically, if you don't know what those terms mean, don't worry too much. But what it means is I'm getting lots of young male students who have damaged their essence and damaged their kidneys at a young age so that basically they have the essence of old people, they have the essence of elderly people. I have young people that I meet that if you didn't know any better, do you know what I mean? Like if you couldn't see them physically and you could just sort of feel them or, or feel their energy, they feel like 80 year olds. It's like elderly people. And it's not just in the classes, you know, <laughs> this is not an attack on the people I teach because I have. Well, there's a couple of reasons it's not attack on the people I teach, because I have people that don't fit that um, generalization. Of course, I have men that aren't fitting into the code. There's just, there is quite a lot of young men that are like that. And also, it's not, um, it's not an attack, because I believe it to be an affliction. So it's no more an attack than if I were to say, I have people, a lot of people that have asthma, I have a lot of people that have digestive conditions. These are not personal attacks on people. So what I'm saying is there is an illness, there is a sickness that younger people are suffering with, many younger males, that is a kind, that is a kidney depletion, it's an essence depletion at too young an age. And it needs to change, it needs to stop. It's not females, it's males that are suffering with this. If I go outside of the class and I just look around, like I'm in London right now, and when I walk around on the streets, it's the same. Like kidney deficient kids everywhere. And by the time they're in their teens, certainly by the time they're in their twenties, many of them look depleted on the level of essence. Now I've heard people say that it's due to stress. Well, maybe. I never believe this thing that stress is worse now than it ever was, you know. Yes, life is stressful. I get it. But stress is a, you know, how stressful would it have been several hundred years ago if, you know, several of your kids could die of the plague, only one of them survived, and the next town could rampage over here, rape and pillage their way through your town, killing everybody and stealing your <laughs> livestock. Like, that would have been quite stressful, I would assume. So I don't go with this whole thing that life is objectively more stressful now than it used to be. I think that possibly subjectively it's more stressful than it used to be, simply because people are emotionally more fragile, which comes down to two things. One of which being the way that people are programmed to deal with their emotions, which I think is wrong in modern society. 
And the second one being that people are kidney deficient. And if you don't have any essence, you have no foundation, no power, no willpower, no drive, no mental fortitude. All these things are depleted when the essence goes. I mean, in Chinese medicine, they link your kidneys to your lower back especially, but your whole spine, the uprightness of your posture, the, the power in your lumbar as well as your knees, meaning that if the essence is depleted, the kidneys become weak, the hips actually. Sometimes they don't talk about this, they link the hips to other things, but to me, the hips can become very weak and fragile as well if the kidneys are depleted. The lower spine, and basically the whole spine can collapse as well, as start aching when the kidneys are weak. So if you think about this kidney connection between kidneys and spine, it's not hard to see. What do we talk about in Western society? If someone has no backbone or they're spineless, it means they're a coward, right? It means they have no ability to stand in the face of danger, no courage to them. And, and these are qualities that I'm seeing that are very prevalent within younger males these days. There's no fight in them anymore. And the problem with that as well is it means you don't have the strength to deal with your emotions. That's the other side of it. And this is probably a more major one, you know. So before we come back to how people's lifestyles, young males' lifestyles are depleting their essence, let's look at this thing with emotions. Because your emotions are obviously something that's generally in flux. Sometimes we get caught in an emotion, of, of course. That can happen. We get locked in a cycle. But generally there's something that is changing. And generally there's something that is reactive to things that we experience. So therefore, my emotions are not something I necessarily choose. They might be something I can work with more intelligently and I can process, but I don't generally choose them. So for example, if something is going to, I don't know, <laughs> jump out of the closet and look terrifying and it's going to give me a sense of fear, that's not my choice. I don't choose to be frightened. That's my reactivity to that external stimuli. The same if something makes me feel angry. That's not my choice. That's my reactivity to an external stimuli. Now, you might say that, of course, as people grow up and process their emotions differently, then they'll change. Of course. But we don't start there. And that's not how most of us are. We have an automatic emotional response to things. So oftentimes now what I'm seeing is younger people, I'm having conversations with people in their 20s. I'm 43, I'm not even that old, 42. Fuck, I don't know, I'm, 40, I'm there, and somewhere around there. And I'm having conversations with people in their 20s and their 30s. You know, I mean, they're 20 years younger than me, I suppose they are quite a lot younger than me. And they're, you know, telling me about, like, they think I'm a caveman because I'm telling them not to be hugely emotionally expressionate. You know, like I'm confused when there's males that are obsessed with their emotions. I don't get that. That's not a trait I associate with men, to be overly emotionally led. Like, why? So when they're telling me, you know, it's like, you've got to follow your emotions and you've got to, like, okay, sure. But look, I'm not saying be emotionally switched off, but there's two sides to this. One side of it is you need to have enough strength to process your emotions. Okay, you can't have one without the other, without it being unhealthy. If this is my emotional state, this is my level of strength, personal strength. If my level of personal strength is very low, then what happens is when I have these emotions, they take me over and I will act upon them. So therefore, if something makes me feel angry, I'll fly into a rage. And maybe that feeling of emotion will damage me more. I become wrapped up. I become a I become an emo, I suppose, or something, you know, just locked in that emotional state because I don't have the strength to process it. But if my personal strength is very high, then what happens is when I have that emotional reaction to something, I'm strong enough in myself that I can choose. I can go, I'll follow that emotion or I won't follow that emotion. So what I have is a balance of stoicness versus emotionally open. That's what people should be trying to cultivate. So if something makes me want to hurt somebody, perhaps somebody has said something and I'm really angry and I want to damage that person, if I don't have any personal strength in me, I'm more likely to act upon it. I'm going to damage that person. I'm going to lash out. And that's no good. What if it's your family member, your neighbor? What if it's your girlfriend? What if it's your wife? What are you going to do? Lash out at them because they've done something that has enraged you? The reason that would happen is because you don't have enough personal strength to go, oh, here is an emotional reaction that I will not act upon. Whereas if my strength is very high, that reactivity is still there. Well, that makes me feel bad, but 
I'm strong enough in myself that I don't follow that emotional tendency. That's called being a male. That's what we do because emotions in males can be quite strong. Uh, you know, violent offenders, things like this. Who are the majority of these people? Males. So where does this personal strength come from? This personal strength comes from your essence, your kidneys. Because the stronger they are, this foundation, not just your physical body, but your mental strength goes up. Your mental strength becomes very high, so I can remain centered. If somebody has very strong kidneys, then they have a degree of stoicness, or they can fall back upon that if they need to. Therefore, the things I desire, even the things I want, I can ignore if I need to, because it's like, okay, I'm strong enough for myself, I don't need to. So what I see in very deficient, kidney-weak men is they don't have the foundation. So therefore, what they do is they just follow their whims and they follow their emotions. And I see it in class when people start to have an emotion come up because martial arts are difficult or, you know, they are. <laughs> they're quite hard and they're uncomfortable. Well, Qigong can be uncomfortable. Nagong can be uncomfortable, certainly the way I teach it. So what happens is when they get uncomfortable, the more kidney depleted a guy is, the less strong their essence is. Like that word essence kind of implies something about your nature as well, doesn't it? The more emotional swings they'll have and they'll go through this whole emotional adventure, which isn't good for them and isn't what I would associate with what I saw young men going through in the past. So don't get me wrong, you know, I'm not saying that men shouldn't be emotionally open. No woman wants a guy that's completely emotionally shut off, do they? Or maybe they do for a while and then they don't like it after that. Call your robot and leave you. Hang on. Sounds like I'm going into my past there. <laughs> but they also don't want a guy or they shouldn't want a guy or they shouldn't be with a guy. It's not safe to be with a guy who doesn't have the personal strength to process those emotions and act upon them if they choose to, or otherwise choose to remain centered. This is kind of the essence of martial arts training, isn't it? How can you have a moral code or a stance that you stand by if you don't have the personal strength to sustain it in the face of emotional reactivity? So that's kind of the mental side of it. Look, if you take away that strength as well, and you give someone all of their emotions, a male especially, and male emotions can be damaging, especially when younger, okay, to the self. I don't even necessarily mean to the outside. That self-loathing that is, is normal in males. I mean, what the suicide rate in males is something people are discussing. This self-loathing, self-rage, unprocessed anger. Where do you think it's going to go? It's going to hit that person inside. Because if they don't have good kidneys, what they have is low self-esteem, low strength. That self-loathing is going to niggly its way into you like water seeping into cracks till it gets right into the center of who you are. So once again, even that negativity people feel is to do with a lack of strength, a lack of kidney essence. Then you have the physical health. Young males are not so robust anymore. They're just not. You hit them, which is normal in martial arts. And I don't even mean hit them, I just mean like clash bodies with young males. Maybe you bang your shoulder into their chest during something or you dig your fist into their ribs or something like that while you're training. Not in a particularly damaging way. But the level of fragility that is expressed by these males is quite incredible. It's like it hits them right through to the center of who they are. And they, they can't take the impact. The physical strength is not there. You know, like the I'm not a particularly muscly guy, but I'm very robust. When you batter and beat my body and kick it and punch it, I don't really notice. I might notice the next day, I'll be honest. <laughs> That's always the same. Battle damage is always felt in the morning when you wake up and you go to get out of bed and you're like, oh, yeah, okay, that guy did hurt me. But at the time, you don't really register it because that's how it should be. It's like, whatever, you shrug it off. Fortitude in the face of, of adversity, physical and emotional, is another thing that I would associate with males that have a very strong essence. So we talk these days, don't we, about like dropping testosterone and I don't even know what the stats are. Does it go down a certain percentage every generation or every year? I don't know. I'm not sure. And okay, I'm sure there's environmental factors. People talk about, I've seen people talk about plastics in the waters and soy in the food. Is that a thing? Maybe I made that up. I don't know. Or um, what do you call it? Women's uh, 
birth control pills, <laughs> getting into the water system or whatever. I'm sure there are environmental factors that, are, that impact male testosterone, and testosterone is linked to essence as well. But you've got to remember that there's also a huge behavioral aspect to what your body does. So what you do with your body, your body will produce what it needs to sustain that state. So the example I often give to people is if I sit in this couch <laughs> and I put the TV on, whatever it is, I'm going to watch every episode of 24. That's, that's a very old program now. Some of you probably don't even know what that is, but <laughs> a very old TV show that I used to like. And it, it, there's a lot of episodes. So I'm going to sit there, I'm going to watch it. I'm going to eat all the pizza and all the cake. I'm going to get very, very fat. And what's going to happen is I'm going to get better at sitting in this chair watching that program. So therefore, my body is going to shape itself into this chair. I'm going to become one with the chair. I'm going to morph into it. Reminds me one time of a woman I saw in a casino in, not Vegas, it was some backwater shit town in America, you know, where nothing happened, tumbleweeds. And I always end up in those towns because I actually really like them. But I had a casino there, a Native American reservation had a casino on it. I went in and there was a woman that clearly was there every day. And she was so fat that she had grown into the fruit machine. Uh, you might think I'm exaggerating, but I mean, the fruit, the, it's probably not a fruit machine, slot machine. I don't even know. I don't know what they do. You know, she's got a credit card here and she's banging away on the coins, slowly depleting her benefit check. So she got nothing left and she'd grown over the front over the whatever this ledge is where the buttons are and around the edge like her fat was growing around the machine and you could kind of see that her body had been in that chair so long gambling that that sadly it's very unfortunate she changed shape to be better at doing that and that's the joke your body will evolve for what you do so your body doesn't understand what's good and bad if you're a couch potato it'll become more efficient at being a couch potato that's what it will do. If you go to the gym and you want to become a bodybuilder, not my personal path, but a lot of people like it, and more power to them, your body will grow in that direction. If you play soccer and that's what you do, your body will grow in that direction. Your body is always evolving whether you like it or not. Now, in order to evolve, it will produce what it needs inside. It will adjust. So if it needs more muscle, it will produce more muscle. Now, if you live a very sedentary lifestyle, Meaning what? You grow up around video games, the internet. That's basically it, isn't it? Video games are the internet. There's nothing else to add. That's what a lot of younger people are growing up with. Why would it bother to produce testosterone? There's no need. You're not doing anything that testosterone, 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 it's a funny word. You're not doing anything that testosterone is needed for. It's not, you don't need to get stronger. There's no competitive edge. You're not fighting anyone. You're just living a sedentary lifestyle. Why would your body need to produce that hormone? So therefore your body just will adapt and it won't bother anymore. To me, that's a major facet of why young guys just don't seem to have any testosterone. And you can see it in their bodies, but you can see it also in their character, in the way they interact with people. It's just not there anymore. So a lot of guys, if they want to, especially if they're young enough, if they want to change this situation, go live an active lifestyle. Guess what? If you live an active lifestyle and you say, fuck the internet, fuck computers, and you go outside and you live outdoors and you live a bit more rugged like you should have done when you were a kid and you do something more physical with your body, your body will start changing chemically on the inside and many of those things will start to change. Guess what? Your essence will become stronger. Many men seem to have depleted their kidneys by sitting there playing video games and watching TV all day long. So here's the thing. And again, I don't want this to sound like an attack. Certainly not an attack on the people I teach because I'll be honest, I really like the people I teach. I really like them very much. So I'm talking not in a personal attack, but more of a medical intervention. <laughs> you know, like, a med like it's a thing that's imbalanced that I'm seeing is I've been teaching young males martial arts. And the martial arts I teach, okay, sometimes they're quite traditional, like forms. But sometimes they're quite uh, different, physical. There is body conditioning, there is partner work, and you know, this group I'm working with at the moment are increasingly starting to learn how to punch and strike, and you know the things that I associate all martial arts with. Every martial artist should be able to punch, even if it's not inherent within their style, it's just something your body should be able to do. Now, when I was growing up and coming up through the external martial arts, I had other males around me about the same age. 
I was normally a little bit younger, actually. I always seem to have people who are a couple of years older, a year or two older, which when you're a teenage guy is actually a big difference, isn't it? When I'm 43, if I have a friend who's 44 or 45, who cares? But when you're 16 and your friend's 18, it does make a little bit of a difference with size and, and what have you and maturity. So I tended to have a few males that were near my age that I was training with. Now, we became very good friends, obviously, in the training, but we were also highly competitive with each other. And that competitiveness was good for us and good for our training. Now, these days, you know, even within my school, I've, I've heard people moan about there shouldn't be any competitiveness. Yes, there should. Between young males, it is natural for there to be competitiveness. But that competitiveness must be channeled in the right way. So there's another concept within martial arts, which is camaraderie, brotherhood, okay, that exists between males that builds, okay, when you train. I was very close to some of those guys I trained with, um, and we had a lot of fun. Do not think for a second that competitiveness and camaraderie are diametrically opposed to one another because they can both exist at the same time as long as the competitiveness is healthy. So, and this, this is a, a concept I want to explore. So if I was training with, with somebody like my friend Luke, who I was friends with from very young, me and him both trained martial arts at the same time, there was definitely a competitiveness between us. Who could strongest, fastest, who could get better at what we were doing at the external martial arts. Then we'd spar, we'd fight not just in the class, but in our free time. And those kicks would get a little heavier on each other and those punches would get a little heavier on each other than was friendly, you know, but it was never really damaging. I think we fought once actually out of anger, but the rest of the time it was just competitive. But at the same time, we had a great friendship and that balance between the two was very normal for male students. So, we caused each other to get better because if Luke got better at whatever a kick, I had to get better at that kick and then he had to get better at the kick and so we egged each other on and then we got better. And there's always been that, certainly when I was younger and I was doing external martial arts, there was always that competitive edge slash camaraderie between me and the other male students. Now, I don't see that anymore. What I see is there is competitiveness, but it comes out differently. It's more catty, you know, like, it's, it's weird. The only competitiveness I see is like stuff like, you know, who is closer to the teacher. It's like political competitiveness, which is a very different thing. It's more like the kind of competitiveness you'd see in a, an office where people are backstabbing each other for position or something. It's, it's weird. Like, when I was studying martial arts, external martial arts, and coming up with the other guys and fighting, like, we never considered that. We never considered that thing. The political status we have within our school was irrelevant to us. Who cares? We were there to learn martial arts. And okay, we liked the teacher and we got on with them, but that was secondary. What was important to us was how good we were and how much better we were than the other males. And that was it. And that formed our friendship. So I know that a lot of people hearing this will say, no, that's wrong. And I think a lot of women hearing this will say it's wrong. And I am going to generalize about genders here because I know that there's females in the school, especially older females, that will constantly tell men they shouldn't compete. It's not true. Women don't understand the way that a healthy male operates. A healthy male with a strong level of essence should compete when younger against other young males. They should grow out of it when they get older, of course, and then you should look back at it and go, that was silly, but you have to go through that stage. You can't rise above something you can't do, is a rule. That's, it's certainly one of the rules of martial arts, make something straight before it's bent, make something hard before it's soft. You have to go to that edge before you step beyond it. So instead what I see is, if you get a lot of men that are deficient because of the kidney depletion, basically, physically deficient, when there is a physically capable male, because of course there are within that group and within any group there are men that don't match this pattern. What instead, instead of competing with them, like if I had a guy who was much stronger and more capable than me in a class, I'd be like, well certainly when I was younger, I'd be like, all oh, right, okay, well that's the bar I have to reach. Thank you very much for giving me a target I must compete with. And in a way I'm competing with myself, but that is the bar. So it's like, okay, you train and then you get to that stage. That's what eggs you on. But instead now what I see is guys will band around that person and become subservient to them. It's like they make them the pack leader. 
it reminds me very much of when the, the, the nerdy kids make friends with the school bully as a, as a form of protection. And I'm not saying the strong guys in the school are, are bullies, not at all, but it's that same kind of mindset. It's strange. It doesn't even set off a competitiveness in them. If anything, it sets off a, another bash to their self-esteem or something. It's like they don't have, it's again, it's that same thing, isn't it? Emotional reactivity. That guy makes me nervous. That guy makes me feel inferior. That's going to set off this emotion rather than the stoic strength in you to go, okay, that guy has something that I should have. So therefore I will train to get it. And then I can still be really good friends with that guy because that camaraderie can come out of that competitiveness. And maybe who knows, maybe you'll build yourself up to a stage where that pike guy starts to compete with you. That's normal. That's how young males should interact with one another. That's why competitive sports were always such a major thing for young males. It was a way for them to compete. Now, if you're going to take a society and you're going to tell all the young males that don't strive, don't compete, don't be physical, don't embrace your masculinity, what do you think is going to happen? You get a lot of weak, kidney deficient, testosterone lacking, unhappy, self-esteemless, emotionally reactive males. That's bad. That's not great. That's not even if you look societally, that's not great for the individual. Because when I meet these guys, they're not happy. When I chat with them, it's not like they're happy with it. You know, they subconsciously, they know, maybe consciously, they know that they're not what they want to be. So therefore, this situation has to change. So therefore, what they've been told or what they're doing is not working for them. Now, Again, I want to point out the difference between healthy competitiveness and unhealthy competitiveness. There is a difference. The balance is camaraderie and competitiveness go together. And if they can work together, it can be a very productive thing between people. Not competing for status, not competing for recognition. Instead, competing amongst those guys to elevate themselves so that they get better and they excel at what they do. Normal stuff. It doesn't really change. Look, my friends, my close friends that I have uh, are people that are good enough at what they do. Sometimes they're in this field. Sometimes they're in the field of Tai Chi. Sometimes they're in the field of Qigong. Some of you know some of my close friends, I'm, I, I'm sure. But then I have friends who aren't in this field. I have friends who are in the world of business. I have friends who are in the world of fitness. You know, they, they just do different things. But they're all highly competent people. Like my close circle, this is. They're all good at what they do. And a part of it is I have a very close, I'm very loyal to them. My loyalty is very, very high. I find a lack of loyalty uninspiring in people. I'm very loyal to them and the camaraderie is very high. Definitely, we're close. But I also compete with them in a way. And not in a bitchy, negative way where I try to put them down. I don't try to damage what they're doing. I don't try to damage their business. I don't try to get in the way of their growth. Not at all. I use their excellences as a way of going, that's A, inspiring and B, pushing me and I should be there too. And then that causes me to get better at what I do. And I have a feeling they probably use me for the same as well. That's male friendship. Well, that's how it should be. I'm able to compete with those guys, and I think they compete with me, without it being a problem. It's, it's not, it doesn't crush us. It doesn't cause any difficulties. It doesn't affect our friendship. And, it, and in fact, maybe the word is competitiveness is wrong because of how many weird negative connotations society is attached to it. So instead, people listening to this who are too caught up in the mind upon me thinking, oh, that person lives in his head rent-free, and not at all. It doesn't cross my mind. It doesn't ruin my day. It's, it's an inspiring aspect of the people, and I'm inspired by those people. Take, for example, the internal martial arts world. All right, take Adam, for example. He doesn't care if I talk about him on this podcast or this video, I'm sure, and, and most people would know who he is. Adam is very good at what he does. Therefore, uh, he causes me to strive to be better because it's inspiring slash competitive. I happen to think Adam, I shouldn't talk for him, does the same with regards to my internal practice as well. So we cause each other to do this and we cause each other to go up. But it doesn't cause us any negative feelings between each other, not even slightly, because we're not emotionally crippled in that way. That's not, that's not how we are. And there's other people in the, in the internal martial arts world that have 
you know, I've met or whatever, and I might be friends with them to a certain degree, or there's people who've reached out that I, I haven't, I'll be honest, haven't made the time to meet, partially because I'm very, very busy. If I was less busy, I'd meet more people, but I'm, I'm very busy. However busy you are, double it, that's how busy I am, because Lotus Hengong is not the only thing I do, okay? I operate in other circles too, I just don't talk about them, so I'm very busy. But if those people had been more inspiring, somebody that I felt was a lot better than me at something, or even better than me in an unrelated field, I would definitely go and meet that person because I want to surround myself with people that cause me to push more. This is how I get better. This is how males have always got better. This is how males have always done things. There are two things males drive for. One, female attention, and two, to outdo their peers. That's it. That's the nature of essence. That's the nature oh, of... Quick break for a fire alarm. <laughs> uh, false alarm. Doesn't matter. Someone's smoking in a bedroom, probably. Uh, so yeah, I can't move <laughs> what I was talking about because I just had to leave the room a second, check what was going on. But yeah, I mean, th these are normal human traits, normal male traits. I don't see how this overly emotionally reactive, non-competitive, live in my own bubble thing is working for people. It doesn't work. It's not working. Young men are suffering terribly and young men are suffering in a really bad way because they don't have a healthy relationship to all these sides of their nature. Now, it kind of struck me that that physical competitiveness probably came about or was learnt when I was play fighting when I was younger. Like when I was out and about, and not even just in martial arts, like playing in the fields. I always used to play in a river. I was climbing trees. I was very physical. We were always wrestling. I remember being at the park and some kid that I barely knew a year older than me would come and you'd mess around and then he'd want to throw you on the floor. So then he'd wrestle, you'd have to hip throw him and you know, whatever, like that's games. That's what you play. You learn to rough and tumble and you learn to physically compete with the other guys. Guys aren't doing that anymore. From what I can make out, they're doing it online through things like Call of Duty or I think that's the game, isn't it? Or whatever the big online game is. I see them with their headsets on like some kind of air traffic controller arguing with some kid who's probably 10 years younger than them that they've never met calling them names while pressing buttons on a screen like what are you doing but it, i kind of get it i suppose actually because video games when i was a kid was two little white lines going up and down a screen and a little square <laughs> bouncing between them i think it was called pong ping pong i don't know like i guess table tennis or whatever it was shit like it would entertain you for half hour at the most even that was pushing it and then the video games after that got really advanced and you had a little blue hedgehog that ran around in loops like it it was hardly a, something to grab you so by the time video games got really good because i've seen them now don't get me wrong i don't like video games i think they're bad for you but i've seen them now i understand why people are sucked into them like they're like interactive movies so it's like whole universes and worlds if that had existed when I was younger, I probably would have got sucked into that. I get it, I understand, but it didn't exist when I was younger. So therefore, after you've done half hour, bleep, bleep, little, fuck that, I'm going outside. And you go out and you play fight with some kids and find a stick to hit them with or something. And you learn about male interactions. That competitiveness was very physical and very visceral and it causes you to grow. Nowadays, if your competitiveness is, I am competing with someone on the other side of the planet via the internet, and it is depersonalized, I don't think it gives you the same thing. Like when I watch people, it's not like it builds, it builds a different kind of competitiveness. I don't have any root, I don't have any rationale for this theory, but it's just my theory. Like if I'm out and I'm playing with a kid, bang, punch the kid, bang, kid punches me, I fall over, we're playing around. You become mates afterwards. There's like a a respect that builds, camaraderie, respect, competitiveness, all comes together, right? If I'm doing it on a video game, I think it develops kind of depersonalized, spiteful competitiveness. It's like a bitchy backstabbing competitiveness as I was talking about before is being learned. It's like, I'm not seeing that guy. He's not in front of me. We're not becoming mates afterwards. We're not really physically competing. It, who's can press the buttons fastest to defeat this guy and who can call the best names? Like, it's there's no benefit to that there's no growth there's no people excelling there's just people being nasty to each other and i think that sort of way of learning to it's just not good it's not healthy and that's why i don't tend to trust young males these days either because there is a nasty stabby manipulative quality to many of them that many of them are struggling with 
Now again, not a personal attack. It's an illness. The illness is a manipulative, backstabbing nastiness that needs to be overcome. And it needs to be overcome by developing essence, essence to your nature, strengthen yourself, robustness, and learning how to channel these things in a healthier way than fucking buttons and shouting at somebody on the other side of the planet. All of this internet interaction has made people so depersonalized. I mean, you don't even have to worry about what you look like because you've got an avatar. So therefore, your physical health doesn't make any difference anymore. And then, of course, that brings you to the worst thing, which is pornography. So this is where I was coming full circle around to, is all the things I've mentioned so far deplete your essence. Okay, Your mind affects your genes. So if I've got a healthy competitiveness and a robust sort of friendship with males and camaraderie and I'm moving my body and I'm physical, your essence will build. It will build. Even if you're in your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, it will build. It will change. Your situation will change. You're just having to do work now that you probably should have done when you were about eight years old through to about 13 or something. You're just playing a bit of catch up because society has fucked you by telling you that staying at home and being on the internet was a better choice for your self-growth. But then there's the other side to it as well, is that when I grew up, pornography was hard to get hold of. You might have had, uh, maybe one of your mates had a magazine or something, but even then, like once you've looked at <laughs> whatever, 20 images in there, it's disinteresting. Like men operate on variety. That's a large part of our sexual appetite, certainly when younger. Hence the reason for men being attracted to multiple people. Um, you know, and you can't deny this in teens and 20s. That's a kind of modus operandi for a lot of males, you know. And if maybe the same for women, who knows? But uh, I identify as male, so I can only talk about being a male from, from a position of experience. So you, you, you weren't really exposed to that many imagery. So these days, like you go on your mobile phone and men grow up with this and they can look up I don't even know how many images, how many naked women have guys seen now? 10,000, 20,000, 30,000? If you're looking at porn from age eight or nine, which statistically I think they say guys do these days because of the internet, you've seen all of the different type of women. I've seen every ethnicity and every body type and every type of breast and every type of sexual act just constantly bombarding your head all of the time on this little device. Now, I didn't grow up with that. The internet didn't come around until I was a bit older and also I was a bit backwards because I was traveling in Asia by the time it, the internet really started to explode. So I never really caught on because I was off in fairly remote parts of China those days a lot of the time and, and not really around. But the internet kind of exploded when I was a bit older. So it wasn't there during my developmental years. It wasn't there during the developmental years of my sexuality or my relationship to sex or, or the opposite gender either. And again, not an attack, because if it had been around, if I'd have been an eight-year-old, a nine-year-old, probably, with access to infinite pornography at the touch of my fingers, probably I would have got sucked down the same road. So I get it. I understand. As it is, I have no problem of that sort. I'm not addicted or sucked into it. But I think it's because I didn't developmentally grow up with it. Now, what's happening is guys are living on pornography. And I'll make this clear straight from the beginning, right? There are some things that are diametrically opposed to your growth within these arts. For example, heroin. That's not helpful. <laughs> heroin is <laughs> directly opposed to progression within Qigong and Tai Chi. All right. Going to the gym is the one everyone always asks about. Can I go to the gym? Now, the truth is you can go to the gym. Yes, you can go to the gym and do some physical exercise. And it gets in the way a little bit of some of the kind of releasing processes. But you can kind of work with it. What is anti your internal development is crazy heavy weights, you know, like big bench press and you compress all those muscles because you're trying to elongate and lengthen it. So weightlifting to the extreme is counter to these arts, but obviously just don't take it to the extreme. Now, everyone always asks about that. It's so funny, isn't it? It's like the biggest question. What's the biggest counter to my internal martial arts? Can I go to the gym? I would say forget that because most men haven't even dealt with an even bigger antithesis to development is arts, which is pornography and masturbation. So I'm telling you now, I'm telling you directly, as someone who's fairly experienced in these arts, if you watch pornography and you are masturbating to other people having sex on a screen, 
you are doing something that is directly opposed to development within these arts. I would also say you're doing something directly opposed to your healthy development as a human being. You are doing something directly opposed to your spiritual growth. So if you are addicted to pornography and masturbating to watching other people have sex, you are sabotaging all of your arts. I would say it's impossible, literally impossible, to become an expert at these arts or even competent beyond a certain level if you are addicted to pornography on the internet. There, there's no soft way to put that. Now again, I'm aware I had it easy because I didn't grow up with it. So therefore it's easy for me to not have pornography in my life, but whatever, like people need to deal with it. Even if you grew up with it, it's got to stop. Even like the shame or embarrassment around it has almost been nullified or got rid of, which I know people are pro that, saying, you know, there should be no shame or embarrassment. I think there should. Like, I think if a guy has a certain degree of stoicness and for, sort of fortitude in themselves, then actually a little bit of embarrassment can be like, well, I won't do that because that's embarrassing, you know. And, and internet porn is like that, because think about what you're doing. You are watching other people have sex and then masturbating over it. I believe the term for that is kind of cuckold. You're essentially a an online cuck, aren't you, watching other people have sex? I mean, it's just kind of pathetic. I mean, it is embarrassing. <laughs> On top of, like, the fact that whatever we say, we know that we don't know within pornography who has been trafficked, who has been manipulated into that situation, who has been lied to. You might say, oh, well, maybe someone's doing it and they're getting paid, so they're a professional. You don't know what traumas got that woman, usually, to be in that position, to have those acts carried out on her. You don't know what manipulation went on by the guys to get her into that position. So therefore, you are supporting those kind of things anyway. So morally and ethically, it is wrong. Karmically, it is wrong. And then physically, for your body, it is wrong. You won't be able to have decent relationships with male, or with females, you just won't. You won't be able to have decent relationships with females because if you're learning how to have sex or connect with a woman physically via pornography, clearly that's not very healthy. That's not healthy for the woman. That's not healthy for you. You're depersonalizing your sex from another person anyway. You're disconnecting from it, which is why so many males apparently now, statistically, have erectile dysfunction, sexual issues, or they have sex and then all these weird deviancies start to come out, like the darker side of their nature is popping out because they're constantly tainted by internet porn. Any addiction is an issue, obviously. Let's take drinking. That's easy. Let's take alcohol. Say I drink the beer and it damages my liver. Oh, damages the liver. Okay, fair enough. Okay, uh, liver. <laughs> Bad anatomy, sorry. It damages my liver. Well, Okay, that's one side of it. But then there's the other side, isn't there? What about the fact that it's eroding your willpower and your personal fortitude? So if, for example, I'm there all day craving a beer, craving a beer, there's a beer waiting for me, I've got to get to the beer, I've got to get to the beer, I've got to get to the beer, get the beer, drink the beer, you've straight away damaged not only your liver, but also your willpower. Your willpower has been affected. What emotion goes with your, what organ goes with your willpower? Your kidneys. Kidneys. Back, spine, fortitude, essence, once again, the addiction itself is damaging the, the willpower, damaging the kidneys. So how about, I don't crave a beer, no interest in it, doesn't enter my head, sit down with some friends at a social dinner, they hand me a beer, I drink the beer. Well, it can still damage the liver, okay, uh, to a certain degree, depending on how much you drink, but it doesn't damage the will. My will is not affected because it's not an addiction, therefore it's not damaging the essence and the kidneys. There's addictions and your kidneys and essence understood straight away. So if pornography has become your addiction, or your mobile phone in general really, isn't it, for anything, Facebook, fucking Instagram, whatever it is, but if, if pornography has become your addiction, well, you've got a two-pronged attack on your essence there, haven't you? Because you've got not only the addiction side of it that is damn it, every time I scroll and I look at the, the porn or whatever, that's my willpower affected, that's my kidneys depleted. But on top of that, every time I then masturbate and ejaculate, or even I'm aroused, that is my essence depleted as well. You're attacking your kidneys constantly. 
So when I chat with guys, like therapeutically as an acupuncturist or as a teacher, I'm actually horrified how much they're consuming. Like people are using porn every day, four or five times a day, some people, masturbating once a day, twice a day, three times a day, four times a day. What are you doing? How do you even function if you ejaculate once a day? I don't know that. Like I've said this to some people, and they're like, it's only once a day. That's huge. That's absolutely massive. That's a lot. No wonder you have no strength. No wonder you have no physical strength. No wonder you have no physical fortitude. No wonder you have no mental fortitude. No wonder you have, don't have any stoicness to deal with your emotions. You've masturbated it all away. You've, you've, <laughs> we've got a generation of men that have reached a stage, like I say, that they feel like elderly people with regards to their kidney strength by the time they're in their 20s or 30s. That damage needs undoing. Now, I kind of have sympathy for it to a certain degree. But then at the same time, I always tell them, get rid of your phone. Step one, get rid of your phone. If you're struggling with your addiction, get rid of your phone. And they say, I can't. I can't. Why? Because I need it. For what? For what? How many generations of human beings existed without their phones? I grew up without one. It was all right. It didn't <laughs> the level of inconvenience didn't damage my life. Your parents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, all the way back to the fucking Mesopotamian times or whatever, they survived. Maybe the generations before that had some kind of Atlantis, they had some kind of communication technique, who knows. But my point is generations and generations of human beings have survived without mobile phones and you can't because what, your banking app's on it? Because your WhatsApp's on it? Because you have to look at a Facebook post to see what your fucking cousin and the other side of the planet have for breakfast and what his fucking dog looks like? Get rid of your phone. Get rid of it. And if you can't get rid of your phone, plug it in like a landline in your house and leave it there. And then just check your phone in your house when you go past. Don't take it out with you. Now, even if you think, well, that's going to be inconvenient, you've got a pornography addiction. That's more important. You imagine this. You imagine if I'm a heroin addict and I'm injecting, uh, I've got to get rid of my heroin addiction because it's ruining my life. Fair enough. So how am I going to get rid of my heroin addiction? I'm going to walk around all day with a load of heroin needles and heroin in my trouser pocket, just walking around with heroin in my pocket. Do you think you're going to give up a heroin addiction with heroin needles and heroin in your pocket? No, of course not, because every time you sit down and you've got an idle five minutes, you're going to get it out. It's no different with your phone. If you have a pornography addiction, internet pornography, I'm assuming it's the internet, it's not the Sears catalog or something these days. If you've got an internet porn addiction, Stop carrying your phone. You are doing the equivalent of a heroin addict keeping needles in their pocket. You may miss some important social news, but you have a bigger issue, is that you need to stop jerking off because you are literally spraying your kidney strength all over your fucking hands or your sock or whatever the fuck you're using. I'm being strong about this, but it's really, really important. If you want to get good at these arts, that has to go. So then people say, oh, well, you know, I need rehab or help or something. And maybe that's true. Maybe, maybe the addiction is that strong, perhaps. But look at it this way. If you're a cultivator, the overcoming of the addiction through the use of your willpower and just making a decision not to do it is a part of your cultivation. That is a part of your cultivation. Because you know what happens? Do you know what happens if you want something and you don't do it? Your willpower goes up. And do you know what happens when your willpower goes up? It's like, going back to your video game analogies, your character fucking levels up. You get a higher percentage on willpower. And do you know what happens? Your kidneys get stronger. So you can literally strengthen your kidneys by just resisting and going, no, I'm not doing that. And I'll build my will. And all these pop psychologists are like, oh, it'll come back as a repressed thing later. Only if you're weak. Only if you're weak. And do you know what happens is you build your willpower through discipline. You won't be weak. That fortitude will build until it's less of an issue. Now, I might be a little bit harsh in this video, I'm aware, but I'm also aware I'm talking to males. And I'm a little bit sexist, so I tend to be a lot softer when I speak. This is how I'm sexist. I don't think women should be chained to the kitchen, definitely not. I think my sexism is that I tend to talk more softly if I'm talking about something that includes women in it as well. Because I am... Um, I like to think quite chivalrous, and I also believe that males should never, should always strive to not upset the opposite sex. But I think men should talk to each other harshly, not cruelly, 
but honestly and truthfully and harshly, and they should give each other a little bit of a hard time. And maybe those manners, that sort of uh, carefulness isn't needed quite the same. That's why I'm talking quite harshly in this video. Also because it's becoming clear how much of a problem it is. How prevalent is it? How many young males are addicted to porn, either honestly, openly, or secretly? It's a lot. It's a lot. So last part. Because it's not an educational course and it's become longer already than I thought. <laughs> How about relationships to other people? We've already talked a little bit about the relationship between males. The best relationships I have with males are the uh, with friends, obviously different with um, you know brothers or, or, or father and son. You know, there's different kinds of male relationships, isn't there? But the best male relationships I have are the ones based upon this camaraderie and gentle competitiveness. That's it. That's how we have fun. That's 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 good. That's that, I like that. But uh, then there's the other thing, which is relationships with women, isn't there? Which is a major part. Human beings are, you can't deny the relationships with opposite sex. Okay, I know that homosexuality and things, but I'm talking generally. Relationships with females, <coughs> excuse me, a little dry, hang on, I'm talking too much. It's water. Looks like I'm drinking wine, doesn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, relationships with females. Like, I also speak to females a lot. I speak to the young girls in the, the school. I chat. I have dinner with them and, uh, you know, with social dinners and we, we talk. And, of course, the conversations about dating comes up and talk about males. And I always hear the same from women. Like, <laughs> women are wanting men that are confident and capable. In fact, out of all, in fact, out of all the qualities they mention, like the kindness and the whatever, the, the ones that come up universally, like women will have different agreements, is competence and personal strength. Like those are the things they want. Oh, I'd like a strong, competent male. Aside from all the other qualities, which of course are important, but the, the strength and the competence is not there in most males because they just don't have any essence. So consequently, they're quite overly emotionally reactive. There's no stoicness in them, and it's not inspiring women particularly anyway. Men don't have, you know, like, put it this way. <clears throat> I think that oh, anything I say is stepping into dodgy territories if you start talking about gender differences. Maybe I'll talk about this in a separate video. I'll come back to gender differences. I don't necessarily want to talk about dating. I don't want to become one of those guys. I'm mostly a Qigong and Tai Chi teacher, but obviously it's a relevant thing to most people's lives. But uh, I'll come back to gender differences another time in the way that men and women relate to one another. I'm, I, I'm, I also have a background in um, psychology and, and sociology as well to a certain extent. And, and obviously that has always interested me. And, and human interrelations, it's in Houston's human psychology is an important part of, of, of how I see life. I worked as a social worker as well in the past and, and mental health has a big interest in me. So I have all this kind of background as well that I tend to keep a little aside from from my teaching here. <clears throat> but um, yeah, I'm trying to skirt around the topic, aren't I? <laughs> trying to sort of edit myself. I'll come back to it in another video, perhaps. But I think that, um, put it this way, women know. Let's just go with this. Women know. I think that men and women have different capabilities. Men are if, if a man is healthy, a man is generally quite good at just, if they're healthy, cutting through the crap and doing what he's doing. Women's strength is they're incredibly empathetic. Like, they, they can feel what's going on in other people's bodies. Like, the sensitivity difference between males and females is massive. Like, if uh, I mentioned her in a previous video, actually. It's funny, isn't it? Two videos in a row, someone, I think about someone, my friend Cindy Engel. If you don't know Cindy Engel, she's a shiatsu, shiatsu therapist from England somewhere, um, who's a good friend of mine, and do look up her work. She talks about, um, she has a different name for it, but essentially a kind of, maybe she does call it somatic empathy. Maybe I got the term from her. I'm not sure. Please look it up anyway. And she talks about how one person's nervous system essentially can read what's going on in someone else's nervous system. I'll tell you what I do. I'll get her to come chat on the podcast. I'll get her to come and talk about it because uh, it'll be very relevant to therapists. I'll do that. As soon as I get back to Bali, I'll contact her and I'll get Cindy to come share some of her work with you because it's very, very interesting. But she talks very much about how people can pick up within their bodies something that's going on in someone else's 
um, body and, and feel it. And I think women very much can do this, like better than guys. Like me and Cindy were friends in Qigong and <laughs> she would always mock me when I was younger about how insensitive I was, like a brick. Compared to her, you know, we start doing Qigong and we would train together when we were younger and she would feel all this stuff and then she'd ask me and I'm like, <laughs> just a brick. But I think that's very much partly my nature, but partly also a gender difference to a certain extent. I think women are far more in tune with those kind of things. So women know, like if you're a serial masturbator, <laughs> which sounds terrible, isn't it? Because it is terrible. Who plays video games all day, whose kidneys are like two little shriveled raisins with a little fluid dribbling out the bottom of them and they're all fucked up and your self-esteem is bad and you have no strong center, so you're emotionally led all the time. They know. A woman can be like that. Say we meet a woman who's on a date who's a little off the rails. It might take us a while to figure it out. Do you know what I mean? Two hours into the date, we're like, okay, something's going on here. <laughs> I couldn't spot that on the outside because I was distracted by the way she looks or whatever. Now I know what she is. And okay, I'm figuring out. Women will know like that. They'll meet you and they'll know. They will sense desperation and patheticness on you, meaning that they're not attracted to you or, or if they are attracted to you, it's for the wrong reason. It's because there's a part of women often that also wants to help. So they get into this kind of therapist role with their partner, which makes the guy feel smothered. So then it creates negativity and also makes the woman feel kind of used and tired of being with men because it becomes therapeutic. So it's not good for anybody anyway. And when women do tend to meet a guy that has strength and fortitude and uh, emotional intelligence and capability and all of those things, do you know what happens? she generally finds that guy very, very attractive, aside from their looks or their charm or any lines or anything like that. It's irrelevant. That cohesion is there. There's no need to do silly things like, which I guess is normal these days, but, you know, they call it sliding into someone's DMs and, woo like, just stop it. Just walk up, just, just meet people in person. What's wrong with you? And I think that, uh, a lot of women and guys, young guys are struggling. We all know there's problems in relationships uh, with young people meeting each other. And it's all because of this to me. Like the, it's, the, it's not the women that are the problem, it's the guys. Because the guys don't have, the, don't have the strength in their essence and in the root of who they are physically and emotionally and mentally to even want to cause a female partner to start to merge with you. So therefore, what you just get is clash. These days, you go online and you get all these like red pill, manosphere shit. If you don't know what that is, it's like a fresh and fit podcast, I think it's called. You'll see it if you look it up. And there's other ones. And it's fucking trash. And it's, it's guys sat blaming women for all the things that are wrong in the world when they don't understand that actually the largest problem is with males. The largest problem is with younger males because they've depleted them to the selves to the point of having nothing inspiring in them. So therefore women are looking for something else essentially to, to do with their lives and they're looking and they're not merging with men. There's no blending in that way at all. So therefore relationships aren't working out. And I get it. If there's nothing inspiring in a male, why would you be inspired by them? Easy. So that's my take on it. Again, a little bit of a rambling talk. It might not feel like there's any point to it, but I'm just highlighting how damaging on every level porn addiction is and a, a lack of a physical lifestyle that's not producing that hormone inside the body, not producing that essence, that energy. Now, if on the other hand you are, as I know some people are, quite physically incapable and quite frail and live on the internet and don't really feel sexually like they want a partner. I know guys like that actually who are quite happy like that, I would say, more power to you. Like, if you're happy like that, grand. But I think if you're someone that's struggling and you have a porn addiction and you ask yourself, am I happy? And the answer is no. Well, then maybe, maybe there's something to look at there. <laughs> maybe that's a sign that something is wrong. And I think that part of the reason that younger people are going to struggle Younger males particularly. Younger women struggle for other reasons. Don't get me wrong. And I'm saying there's no problems with younger women. But younger males are going to struggle because of this. Because of this stupid addiction to touching their penis while watching people they don't know have sex. What a silly thing to ruin your life over. <laughs> as far as I see it.